in Spanish and then in English. Muy buenas tardes. Bienvenidos a este nuevo ciclo de talleres gratuitos y abiertos para toda la comunidad latina en, en Irlanda, Rompe el Ciclo. Mi nombre es Yuridia Herrera y formo parte de Latina Women Against Violence. A nombre de todas mis compañeras, Sharon Morrison de Clar Confl Conflict Clarity y la Embajada de México en Irlanda, quiero darles una calurosa bienvenida. Latina Women Against Violence es un grupo de apoyo voluntario dirigido por y para mujeres de comunidades latinoamericanas en Irlanda. Trabajamos para poner fin a la violencia que viven las mujeres y promover su proceso de empoderamiento. Sharon, Morris, Sharon Morrissey es mediadora certificada, experta en mediación familiar y de trabajo, autora del libro That's Not My Ending. Tiene una maestría en resolución de conflictos y tiene cualificaciones en mediación familiar e inclusión infantil. Ella cuenta con más de 25 años de experiencia trabajando con parejas, familias, grupos, en lugares de trabajo y como docente. La Embajada de México en Irlanda, el Gobierno de México estableció relaciones diplomáticas con Irlanda a partir de 1975 y en 1991 se abrió la Embajada residente en Dublín. La actual embajadora es la señora Carolina Zaragoza Flores. Agradecemos su apoyo. En esta oportunidad queremos crear un espacio para que podamos intercambiar conocimientos, experiencias y compartir ideas. El taller de hoy, Mediación en Conflictos Familiares, nuestra misión será informar y juntas comprender qué es la mediación, cómo funciona, en qué casos procede y cómo puede ayudar en los conflictos de pareja, separación y o divorcio así como los protocolos aplicables en los casos donde hay violencia y cuando hay hijos menores de edad. Esperamos que en un futuro podamos ir construyendo una red o una comunidad de mujeres latinoamericanas que esté informada sobre sus derechos y que conozca los recursos que están disponibles en Irlanda. Este nuevo ciclo de talleres está facilitado por Latina Women Against Violence y también por personas que tienen experiencia o expertise en diferentes temáticas. El apoyo de todas nuestras facilitadoras y facilitadores es totalmente voluntario y es gracias a estos que nuestros talleres tienen un carácter gratuito. Como les adelantaba, la temática de este, de este taller es mediación en conflictos familiares en el que hablaremos y responderemos a preguntas como ¿qué es la mediación? ¿qué esperar del proceso? ¿cuál es el marco legal de la mediación en Irlanda? ¿es la mediación igual en casos transfronterizos? ¿cómo funciona la mediación familiar? ¿cómo puede ayudar la mediación a prevenir los conflictos en general o conflictos familiares? ¿es más efectiva eh, la mediación en casos de violencia doméstica? Esta y otras preguntas podrán ser respondidas en este taller. Sharon Bienvenida al taller, es todo tuyo y estaré yo en los controles y todas las preguntas que quieran hacer pueden ir dejándolas en el chat o hacerlas al final del taller porque vamos a grabar inicialmente. Now in English. So as I mentioned, the workshop will be divided into parts, the lecture and questions, questions and answers. The first part will be recorded. Good afternoon. Welcome to this new cycle of free and open workshops for all the Latino community in Ireland. Break the cycle. My name is Yuridia Herrera, and I am part of Latina Women Against Violence. On behalf of, of my colleagues, Sharon Morrison, Sharon Morrison from Clari Conflict Clarity and the Embassy of Mexico in Ireland, I would like to extend a warm welcome to you. Latina Women Against Violence is a voluntary support group run by room by and for women from Latin American communities in Ireland. We work to end violence against women and promote women's empowerment. Sharon Morrison is a certified mediator, expert in family and workplace mediation, and author of the book, That's Not My Ending. She holds a master's, in degree, master's degree in conflict resolution, and she has qualifications in family mediation and child inclusion. She has over 25 years of experience working with couples, families, group, in workplaces, and as a teacher, as a lecturer. 
the Embassy of Mexico in, Irla in Ireland. The government of Mexico established uh, diplomatic relations with Ireland in 1975 and in 1991. The resident embassy was opened in Dublin. The current ambassador is Mrs. Carolina Zaragoza Flores. In this opportunity, we want to create a space where we can exchange knowledge, experiences, and share ideas. In today's workshop, Mediation in Family Disputes, our mission is to inform and together understand what mediation is, how it works, in which cases it's appropriate, and how it can help in couple conflicts and or separation or divorce, as well as the protocols applicable in cases where there is violence and when there are minor children. We hope that in the future, we can build a network of a community of, of Latin America women who are informed about their rights and who are aware of the resources that are available in Ireland. This new cycle of workshops is facilitated by Latina women against violence and people who have experience of or expertise on different areas. The support of all of us, our facilitators is entirely voluntarily and is thanks to them that our workshops are free of charge. And as I said before, the theme of this workshop is mediation in family disputes, in which we will discuss and answer questions such as what mediation is, what to expect from the process, what is the legal framework for mediation in Ireland, uh, is mediation the same in cross-border cases, how does family mediation work, how can mediation help to prevent family conflict, and is mediation effective in cases of domestic violence? These and other questions can be answered in this workshop. Sharon, welcome to the workshop. It's all yours. I will be at the controls and all the questions you want to ask can be left in the chat or asked at the end of the workshop because as I mentioned before, the first part will be recording. Thank you so much. And Sharon, the floor is yours. Thanks, Yuri. Good evening, everybody. Um, it is very interesting to know that the Mexican embassy was open in Ireland uh, the year I was born. So um, that's that's a new piece of information for me this evening. Um, it is a pleasure to be here with you all and just to reiterate what Yuri said, that the first part of this is recorded. So I have no issue at all answering questions as we go along, but just be mindful of your own confidentiality if you want to share experiences. Um, the second part is not recorded, so um, that's up to you, but just so you're aware. So as Yuri said, I am a mediator. I have worked solely in mediation for about 10 years at this point. And before that, I worked with children and families in all different types of cases um, for about 15 years before that, from um, early education to early intervention um, in, in very challenging circumstances sometimes. So for me, um, I have slides and I'll share them in a second with you. But for me, mediation is an exceptional tool um, when used appropriately and effectively so it's as, as effective as your mediator um, to support people who are changing the dynamics of their family so primarily i work in three areas so um, there is mediation with families mediation with workplaces and mediation with the self um, so there, because there are three main areas that conflict can arise and will arise. And it is also very interesting that we all feel that conflict is very, uh, is a negative thing when in actual fact, when we know how to manage it and how to master it things will become easier when we understand it ourselves. So I'm just going to share my screen, if that's okay. Yuri, is everything okay? Can everybody hear me okay? Am I, if I'm talking too fast, you need to tell me to slow down. Um, so, oh, okay. Okay, great. 
Okay, so that's simply um, my logo and my brand. So the next one is just a little bit about myself. Um, so I am a wife to my husband, Mass. I'm a mom to Lizzie, who's 15, and to Molly, who's 22. And my fur baby uh, dog is Ben, and he's a year and a half. Um, I am the founder of Conflict Clarity, which is a specific mediation se a service and conflict resolution service, which provides mediation to people who are in conflict difficulties in a really holistic and systemic manner. So when I say this, what I mean is we don't just, when people come with a conflict to be resolved, we don't just look at that conflict. We look at all of the things that surround the conflict and we try to understand if certain things are changed, how the conflict would look differently or would feel differently for the people involved. Now, if I move this down here. So, as I said, I retrained in 2016 to become a mediator after several years of working in family support. And in the family support service, because I previously, when I was younger, I had been married and it was not a very um, healthy relationship and we broke up. Um, I was given cases where there was family relationship breakdown because I suppose I had I didn't have any qualifications, but I did have experiential um, information on how the court system worked. So when I was given these cases, I at first hand could see the implications that the acrimony and the anim, you know, the animosity that children particularly families were going through and it was absolutely horrific um, and we were seeing children or I was seeing children whose levels of anxiety were just so high because of the conflict that was happening in their family home so there was no safe space for these children and I suppose there was one particular case that always changes the trajectory, I think, of, of a practitioner. And this one particular case that I won't go into for obviously confidentiality reasons, but I really thought about it and I thought there has to be a better way to try and support families going through this level of, oh, anger um, to make things better for everybody involved. And funnily, when I was going through my own divorce, um, mediation wasn't an option for, for me or for us as, as a couple. Um, it was relatively new. Well, divorce is relatively new in Ireland. It's about 25, 26 years old at this point. Um, so mediation was a very new concept at that point and there was no regulation in it and you know while there were good quality mediators for, for certain um, I suppose my own particular case was was a difficult one you know if I was looking at it now from the the point of view as a mediator I suppose it was it was a particularly difficult case so when I am working with people I suppose I see it from lots of different angles and different spaces and particularly I see it from the impact the personal impact that the relationship breakdown had on my daughter at the time okay so I retrained as I say and um you know I wasn't sure what it is I wanted to do it wasn't like I went through the space and said oh I know I'll be a mediator and um, that didn't happen because I didn't know much about mediation and I looked at counseling and I looked at psychologies but I just felt that when people are in crisis and if somebody goes into counseling there is a lot of having to go back to meet the present and to go forward and when people are angry with each other, we don't really have time to do that. It takes too long. And while it takes too long, we're causing more harm to ourselves and to others. So mediation 
kind of fitted what I wanted to do, but I did have other qualifications in counselling, things like that. So I felt maybe by putting all of these qualifications together that it would give an overall picture of how families could be supported to look at where they were at right now and look at the difficulties that they were experiencing and then empower each person within the family to see what it is they wanted, what they wanted their life going forward to look like, and then work towards that. Now, so therefore mediation, and one of the, the very, I think, lovely points of mediation is that it is self-determining. So we have the power to look at where we're at now and with support, even when we're chronically unwell or unhappy, with support to be able to look at where we are now and look at what we want in the future. And this, for me, was exactly what I wanted to support people to do. So this is what, and this is why, I suppose, mediation ticked all those boxes for me. I didn't get into mediation because it was just a, a good idea, even though it was. It was something I really was passionate about. And I still am all of these years later. The more I learn about people, the more I understand about people, the more I understand about the mediation, how mediation works. It is truly, from my point of view, a thrilling experience to be in rooms with people when they're going through the mediation process. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what mediation is and how it works and how it works in each of the different kind of sectors. So mediation is voluntary. So it's a voluntary, there's four main pillars and these are the four main pillars here. So it's a voluntary process. It's self-determining, it's facilitative and it's confidential. Now I'm going to just go through each of these uh, and give you examples because I think sometimes that helps. Um, so it's a voluntary process. So when we say voluntary, this has come up for debate quite a lot um, because I see nobody wants to be sitting in a mediation room. So when people are with me, they don't want to be there. None of us want to have to talk to somebody about our relationships and how they are possibly not working. OK, so when we say voluntary, what we're what I believe we mean is that all other areas and avenues have probably been exhausted at this point. And now we're given an opportunity or a chance to do things in a way that might be less adversarial and take the heat and the anger out of situations. An awful lot of times I will have people coming to me who have been in the court system already. So they have tried going to court, they have tried getting you know, a judge to tell them what to do. And then the court will say, you actually have to go to mediation. And technically that's not voluntary either. If somebody tells you, you have to go. So when the people are in the room with me, I need to check that they're okay to be there. Is this something you really want to do? Or are you just here because you were told to? And either is fine. If somebody is here because they were told to be here, as long as they're still agreeing with me to be there, I can support them. But if somebody is there, they don't want to be there and they're not open to the process, then there's very little I can do to support them. OK, so that's just a word on voluntary. Um, I laugh mostly because, you know, nobody comes to see me voluntarily. Nobody wants to be sitting with me. And that's that is one thing for sure. It's self-determining. So as I've spoken about briefly. We have to have an idea what it is we want to be able to move forward. 
And self-determination is quite an interesting concept because I know for me personally, when my relationship was broken down and I see it with other families all of the time, I didn't know what I wanted because I was too busy, I suppose, trying to survive what was happening to me. I was too busy working two and three jobs to make sure there was enough money to support the mortgage, to support all the bills. I was too busy trying to sort out court dates and maintenance and access, and all of these things. So if somebody had actually said to me, I need you to be self-determining now, I don't know if I would have had the capacity and the headspace to be able to do that. So as a mediator, specializing with families now, when people do come to me in mediation, I give them the time and the space that they need to know what it is they want to work towards. And sometimes people will come in and they will say that they want X. But the more we talk and the more we, you know, option generate and question and look at different things, they might realize they don't want X at all. They want Y. So through the process of mediation, we become really clear on what the self-determining outcome is. And that leads me on to the next point here. So that's the facilitative. It is my job to facilitate those internal and external discussions. So as I said, I sit with people, I ask questions, I clarify things if I don't understand, I question things you know if if somebody is saying oh, I want the house and the children and the car and everything else I want all of these things and I would question you know why do you think maybe that's fair or why is it you think you want all of those things or you know all all of these questions it is my job to get people thinking about what it is they want so I facilitate all of these external discussions so between the parties and the internal discussions that we all have when we're, well, all the time, I, I always have internal discussions. So um, I think probably a lot of people are like me that something is happening and they're, they're saying, yes, I'm gonna do it this way. Maybe there's a different way to do it. And the process support those discussions to be had. And the last pillar and a very important pillar then is the confidentiality. So, I think a more appropriate thing to say is that mediation is confidential um, in the area of the information that people receive about each other through the, the discussions and through all the facilitations. That information cannot be used in court for any other reasons you know, to try and get one up on somebody else. Or, you know, if, if um, somebody says that they've done something and it wasn't in a previous contract, those type of things. So it's confidential in relation to, to those, those specific things. There are exceptions to confidentiality. And the exceptions are if a, part, if a person in my room tells me that they're going to harm themselves or somebody else, well, then I can't hold that information. I need to support them to seek help if they're going to harm themselves. And I need to contact the Gardaí if they tell me they're going to harm somebody else. Because when we're talking about um, relationship breakdown, we know that the most um, dangerous time for a woman to leave a relationship, or for a woman is when they're in the process of leaving the relationship. So if, for example, a partner says, I'm going to kill Sharon when I leave here today, I have to take that very seriously and I have to contact the Gardaí about that. Now, it could be a flippant remark that somebody makes when they're very angry, but that's not for me to decide and it's not for me to judge. OK, I have the information. I need to do something about it. The next area that there is no confidentiality in is in the case of child abuse. So if anybody tells me that a child has been harmed in any way, I have to report that to the relevant authorities. 
um, if you tell me that you intend to commit a crime or you have committed crimes in the past, obviously I'm going to have to report that to the Gardaí. If you tell me anything around money laundering or you know, fraud, that needs to be reported to the Gardaí. Now, there is another, there's two primary um, issues with confidentiality here as well, is that since 2017 and the Mediation Act was implemented in Ireland, there is a clause in the Mediation Act that says a judge can call me to court and ask me what was discussed in the mediation. Now, that shouldn't really happen because in usually the court will see that mediation is a confidential process. Um, but if a judge calls me, obviously I have I have to go to court. And the next one is if that both parties said that I had done something wrong in the mediation. So maybe that I had breached confidentiality or that I had given advice when I shouldn't have given advice. They can, you know, they could um, go to the MII, which is my governing body, and say that I had breached one of my ethics and I have the right to defend myself. So in that case, I can talk to, you know, I can talk about what happened. But other than that, you know, it's quite limited as to um, what can be talked about, particularly outside of the mediation room. Um, in terms of if one goes to court, if a judge is calling me as a mediator to court, I'm very specific in how I answer questions that are asked. So if a judge asks a specific question, there will be a specific answer. It won't be a narrative about the whole um, mediation process and who said what in the process. So it's, you know, these are our pillars and these are how we work. So it supports people. The really good positive thing about mediation is as a process, it supports people to say what their needs are. And yes, we might have to take some time to work on that but overall it will help people and support them to say what their needs are to say how they feel about what has happened in the past what has brought them brought you here today and what you hope for the future and then for to have the other person hear those needs and the upset that has been caused and the hurt and the trauma because people tend to heal when they feel they've been hurt and mediation is a really good um, process for that. So it is facilitated by a neutral, independent third party. So that is the mediator. So when we say neutral, it was somebody that, you know, is not invested in the outcome of the mediation. Now, I suppose just to, to kind of quantify that is I am always invested in the outcome of the mediation because I always want what the parties want for themselves. So, you know, when a party is clear, when both parties are clear what they want, and maybe there are completely different ends of the spectrum on how to get there, I am invested in trying to ensure that they get the outcomes that they, they feel are correct and right for them. So, you know, what happens is as a mediator, you do become invested in the process, but you're as a mediator, I always have to be aware of when that happens and remember that I have to be neutral and impartial to both parties. So, for example, I can't be saying to one person, you should say this, you should say that. That's not what happens. OK, so I'm completely outside of that. Um, now, if anybody has questions or if I am talking too fast, please, please just let me know um, and I can slow, slow it down. So because mediation is a process, right, it has a pre-mediation phase. So in the pre-mediation phase, I would, so somebody will make a phone call or I will get an email to contact somebody or, you know, a solicitor will ring sometimes and say, I have a couple here who are agreeing to come to mediation. So that's the voluntary part. And what I, and they will give me phone numbers. Now, what they will usually what I would say to a solicitor or you know if one party rings I would say look I need you to get them to ring me I need the people themselves to ring me because this again shows me that voluntarily they want to be there and they want to make contact and they want to have this discussion 
So in that remediation phase, I'm checking all of those things. I'm checking that they want to come, that they're not being forced to come by anybody else, that, you know, okay, it's not something they want to do, but that they're willing to give it a try. I want to make sure that um, they feel safe in the process. And when I say safe, I mean physically and emotionally safe. So it's, it's two layers. I'm always checking for the layers of safety. It's very rare at the pre-mediation phase, you will have a party person tell you that there has been domestic abuse in the relationship. It is through screening and asking questions, I will learn and understand that maybe there has been some domestic abuse issues. Um, there is a school of thought in mediation that if there is any type of domestic abuse in mediation, um, it shouldn't, mediation shouldn't happen. Um, and I understand why that is. Um, however, I suppose my view on that is that if somebody is in an abusive situation is telling and they, they come and say they want to be in mediation is telling them that they can't further abusing them in a way so in my view there's there's ways around that and and you know by protecting people um however if there is a barring order in place mediation cannot occur because there's a legal order in place so um th that's kind of a no that is a no for me so all of this is happening in the pre-mediation phase. I'm collecting all of this information and I am conflict mapping it in my mind. I'm thinking about questions that possibly I need to ask and routes that possibly I need to take. But I am also being very mindful that this is not my conflict and it is not for me to make decisions for the parties. The decisions will be made by the parties themselves. So then there's an opening. So I explain the process like I have been doing here. And, you know, we talk about the rules and how to listen to each other and all of that. Then both parties will have their turn to say what happens in the process. So why they're there, what they want to achieve. You know, they're, they're going to talk about, you know, what got them there. Um, so that happens for both parties. And in that, I will reflect back what I've heard, reframe back what I've heard. And the reason that's done is so that each party has now heard twice at a minimum. Why, from the point of view of each person, that they're there. And sometimes, and in some cases, actually, it, it is the first time that people hear that from a really truthful, open, you know, perspective. Um, because when we're in conflict, as we know, it's all about blaming outwards. It's not my fault. It's their fault. They said this, they did that. But sometimes hearing why the other person is there, each person goes, oh goodness, I didn't know they felt that way. Or I didn't know when I said that it really hurt the other person. So it's a very, I suppose it's a very enlightening phase in the process that has to be handled gently and carefully. And then we get to the part where we clarify and discuss from there, options are brought up. So I think we should do this. No, I think we should do this. And then there's a discussion around all of that. And then we come to the decision-making and agreement. So it's very clear. So the process doesn't change whether I am mediating for the first time or for the hundredth time with the same people, the process is the process. This is how it works. It's very clear. It's got stages. It's got, you know, pieces that we will go to, we will move from, we will go back to, but the stages are there. So it has a start, a middle and an end. And in the mediation that I do, I look at the past, but the primary focus for this is to understand, right? So I look at the past briefly with, with parties and the primary focus is to understand how decisions were made in the past, how people communicated in the past. And when, when I have that information, I can support and facilitate people to move those decision-making strategies 
change them if they're, you know, really, really causing issue or to use them to move forward. The mediator is non-judgmental and will not tell anybody what to do. Again, non-judgmental for me is, I think everybody is judgmental and everybody makes judgments. The, the point here is to be aware of the judgments that I am making and catch myself when I'm making those judgments. Okay, that's really important. But I think it's really disingenuous to say that the mediator is non-judgmental. And I suppose I really try to work from, I, I do very much so work from a place of honesty and integrity. So as a mediator, I hold the process, right? So the process being what we just went through there, I hold that and I keep that sacred into the front and then but the, the parties then hold the outcomes. So I can never tell anybody what to do or what they should do. That's the job of the parties in mediation. So it's a powerful experience for people who attend mediation. So generally being in a conflict sometimes is easy. Okay, some people love conflict, right? Um, I don't love it. Um, I know my family say, we're not, gonna, we're not going to be in a conflict with you because you know you win. Um, so they, they, they kind of don't get into a conflict with me. But what it is, is that we have to look at our own behavior when a conflict happens. And when we are in a conflict, it is, I think probably it is normal to blame others. And actually, there's, there's more or less two types of, of people that I will see. It will, number one, will be blaming others. It's not my fault. It's Yuri's fault. And I didn't do this. And it would have been fine unless Yuri said this, you know. And then you have the other, another person who will say, yes, it's all my fault. I take responsibility for everything. Nothing would have happened. Only I said this, this, and this. And neither of those positions are correct or right. So we need to stop. We need to take that pause and we need to kind of dis, what's the word, dissect the issue and take it apart and look at these behaviours and look particularly each person to look at their own behaviour in the conflict. And that's not easy. OK, so taking responsibility for resolving a conflict is hard. It is hard. And being responsible for the outcome of a conflict is hard. But I suppose what need what one needs to understand is if we don't, if we don't, if we're not going to take responsibility for the outcome, what happens next? In family, is it okay for me to hand over where my children go on a weekday night or weekend to a judge who does not know me, who does not know my children, who does not know my partner, who does not know anything about us except what's been written on a page. Is that okay? And I would suggest that it's not. I would suggest it's an easy thing to do to go into a court and have a judge who knows nothing about your family to make a decision. I would suggest that sitting with somebody in that uncomfortableness, in that having to take responsibility, in that having to be open to hearing somebody that you're really angry with for whatever reason, that is harder. But the outcome is much better. So where do we begin to resolve conflicts? And I suppose primarily we begin to resolve a conflict when we understand and we know what a conflict is for us. So in a relationship, in an intimate relationship, we will know that our partner or significant other will know how to press our buttons, we'll know how to make us react, we'll know what things really upset us, really don't, you know, really drive us mad. 
And they do this because we react to that. And so when we react, we have to take responsibility for that reaction. So it is, it is really important to understand that we have a choice. And I know that maybe a kind of, maybe some people are in relationships that there is domestic abuse. And in those circumstances, the person will feel, no, I don't have a choice. I have nowhere to go. Um, I don't have the money to go. I am terrified about what this person is going to say, do, act, whatever. And what I can say to that is there are, for example, this, this amazing group, there are ways and means to be able to circumnavigate that. And it may take longer and it may cost more in terms of emotional and financial stability. But there are ways and it is about it is about putting your needs, your belief, your right to be happy, healthy and safe before everything else. And working from that place, knowing that you have the right to be heard, happy, healthy and safe. It is about that belief. And when we know that. When we believe that, we know we deserve better. We will go try and seek support to find that. Okay, I am not saying it's easy. Not for one second am I saying it's easy. And I say that from experience, personal and professional. But it is a choice. It is, it is a hard choice, but it's a choice that is necessary if we want to grow and be our full potential um, and mediation when done properly and correctly will support you to find that almost inner voice. It will support you to make those decisions. It will support you in high level conflicts to know when to not say anything and know when to be able to voice your concerns. So mediation is that too that can be used in these situations. Self-awareness is part of the self-determining outcome. Now, that is a big statement. And I suppose that's kind of what we've been, I've been saying here, is that when we're aware of how we manage conflicts, how we saw conflicts being solved or not when we were younger, how we react in a conflict because it's it's not comfortable all of these things when we understand and are aware of all of these things that will lead us to our self-determining outcome now as i said and explained i would have many people who will come into me and say i want the house the car the children and 600 euro a week maintenance um and I will say to them, why is, why is it that you want all of these things? And, you know, people will give me an explanation as to why they will want all of these things. And then when we break it down and we look at what is needed and, you know, what the other person needs to survive and, you know, all of those. Sometimes those big overt kind of I want is masking the, well, actually, this is what I need. So there is a huge difference between the wants and the needs. And when people are hurt, and I would see this a lot of times with families, when people are hurt, they're going to want to take away everything because they're hurting so much, thinking that if they get it, they won't hurt anymore. But that's not the case. So it is my role as a mediator then to support people to see what is the difference between the wants and the needs and what is going to support one to heal those hearts and to begin to learn to trust yourself and to trust others again. And this is where mediation can be very, it's not counselling, 
because you're coming away with an agreement in your hand that will move you forward from the place you are now, be it for a couple of weeks or a couple of months or a year, and you come back to mediation again if your communication hasn't improved and you can do it yourself. But the idea of mediation is that it's a stepping stone. It takes you from a very difficult place through role modeling, positive communication and problem solving skills and knowing of yourself to a place where you can make those decisions yourself. So it, it, it really is an all round piece of work. Um, so what do you want as your solution? How do you want to live your life? And what do you look like? What do you want your family to look like? I mean, primarily one has to remember that it's the children's needs that need to be met in relation to access and maintenance okay so you know it's not about I will let you see the child if you pay me this that's not how it works it's about a child's right to have access to both of their parents so this needs to be taken into account in in um, mediation agreements and of course we go back to making sure that the children want to go making sure that the children are safe all of those things. So we're, we're checking all of the time what it is is necessary and how we can make things work in a healthy way. So it, it, it's like taking a family that did work, maybe dysfunctionally, right? But it did work. So we're taking that system apart and we're, we're putting in different systems that are now hopefully going to work somewhat more functionally, um, considering that we're all perfectly imperfect. Um, you know, so that nothing is ever going to be 100%. I work with children. So there, you know, there's child inclusive mediation where mediation or where the children are included, their right. So under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, children have the right to have their voice heard by the mediator in uh, matters that affect them so that will be where they're living where they're going to school you know seeing their friends all of those things okay so they they do have the right to have their voices heard sometimes parents think that that is too much for the children and in some cases it is because it depends on the level of animosity and acrimony beforehand and conflict um you know children might be completely traumatized by what's happened before um, so speaking with a mediator may not be very beneficial. So that's child inclusive mediation. And the other one is child focused mediation. So I suppose out of all of the family mediations that I do, I would probably do 25, 30% child inclusive mediation where parents agree that their children can come and speak with me. Um, and, you know, it's not like a mediation situation. It is done completely differently, obviously. Um, and again, depend the activities that we will do will depend on the age and stage of development of children and all of that. So I have qualifications in that. Um, but primarily it's child focused mediation where every decision that's made in relation to mediation is focused on what this is the outcome for you. What is going to be the outcome for your children? Can you tell me what that's going to look like for your children? How do you think your child is going to react to that? How do you think it's going to be if your child misses football on a Tuesday? How is that going to impact his friends? How is it going to be if your child is picked up from school by the non-resident parent? What are his friend, their friends going to say? So all of these questions are asked. So it, it's really about, as I said, it's not if you give me this, I'll let you have this. It's about what is best for your children in these situations. OK, and just to say that relationship breakdown doesn't harm children. Conflict harms children. And that's really important to know, to be aware of, and to understand, okay? It is the conflict that causes trauma for children, 
not the relationship breakdown. Children will grow up if the relationship breakdown happens and it is negotiated and dealt with in a mature and adult way that there isn't protracted conflict. There's always going to be some level of distress for children when their parents break up. But if it is dealt with in a way that is mature and centered on the needs of children, those children are going to grow up knowing that they were loved by both parents, that they are loved by both parents enough that their needs were put first, that the outcomes that they that their parents worked for and worked with and worked to put their health, physical, emotional, mental, well-being and health to the fore. Those children will grow up to be well-rounded individuals. It is the children that are constantly seeing their parents fighting, on, like physically, emotionally, like all that different type of, you know, abuse and hatred and vitriol that comes from, from people who are angry, that will cause problems for children. Now, we touched on this briefly at the start. Um, I suppose, as I said to you at the start, there is, there is a school of thought that mediation should never occur. With, with domestic abuse cases. And I understand that absolutely, as I said, and I've given my point on what I, I think um, should work. I think it should be on a case by case basis all of the time. I don't think there should be a blanket rule for anything uh, ever. You know, I think everything needs to be taken on its merits and on the information we have and being, I suppose, um, secure enough in our decision making processes and our checks and balances and the health and safety pieces that are put in all of those things. But I'm just looking at. Yeah, so I suppose a lot of times what I see in my mediation room is that. There is, there is always a level of domestic abuse when a relationship breaks down. And that is, that is down to the person that the relationship is with, knows you intimately, knows what's going to really wreck your head. Um, and we'll keep doing that to get a reaction. What I have seen a lot of is the physical violence that affects women and the emotional abuse that affects men. So in some cases, you will have women saying to men, you're never going to see your children again unless you do X, Y, and Z. Um, and that causes a huge toll on men um, to the point where a lot of men will speak about suicide um, in the mediation room with me. Um, speak about suicide ideation or actually have a plan um, to do something to harm themselves. So that, that is something that comes up quite a lot. In terms of physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, coercive control in the relationship, obviously nobody, no woman or man, should have to put up with these things that are happening. Um, what I do see is that the physical violence is more severe because of the sheer size and strength. Um, and in those cases, it would it is I do stop the mediation to ensure that that person's health and safety, physical and emotional, are looked after. So that may be the first thing that needs to happen. So does this woman need to go to the Gardaí? Does this woman need to go to the court service? Do they need to be attached to different services like women's aid? Do they need to be in refuge? You know, it, it's all of these questions that need to be asked. And that happens at the beginning. Where were we? in the pre-mediation section of um, 
here, is it? Yeah, in the pre mediation phase. Now, while it's happening in the pre mediation phase, and overt questions are being asked, basically, can you describe any abusive situations in your relationship? You know, some people will say, no, no, there was no abuse. But throughout the discussion, and I'm noting that, but throughout the discussion, certain things could be said that might lead me to believe that either the person was unaware that they were being emotionally or financially abused or, or physically, you know, well, you just push me against the door or, you know, whatever. Um, and sometimes I think we live in situations where we think certain things, certain behaviours are normal. Um, and those, those behaviours sometimes have to be questioned. Okay, so this is what I mean when I talk about the mediation process that I hold and that I have and the business that I do is systemic. It's not all or nothing. It is about asking questions. It is about taking the information. It's about asking more questions. It's about looking at how people perceive themselves and perceive the issues and perceive the situation. It, again, obviously, culturally, there's, there's going to be differences between the different cultures that I work with. I need to be aware of those. I need to be aware of different religions and how that affects how people, um, you know, communicate with each other. And but at the end of the day, we have to work within the law. And within the law here means that children can't you know, be slapped at any point. You know, there are laws against domestic abuse. Um, you know, children have to have access to both parents. Children have to be provided for. So all of these laws I need to be aware of and I need to be making the parties that I work with aware of if they're not aware of those. Um, and support them with that information to put a mediated plan, an agreement together so that they are working within the Irish laws in the Irish context. I heard Yuri mention earlier about cross-border mediations. There's a very specific course that um, you know, mediators undertake if they want to do cross-border mediations. There are laws that um, are governed with that again as well. Um, and again, it's a very case by case, individualized type of program and plan that will have to be put in place to try and, and work through those. The MII, as I say, which is the governing body, my governing body, I'm also accredited by the International Mediation Institute, um, will, you know, they put on these very specific courses like the family mediation course um, so that, you know, parties can be supported to have these discussions and make sure that the children's needs are met um, with, within that context and that nobody rem remembering that it's the child's right to have access to both parents. Um, so that, that definitely is, you know, it, it's a big thing in Ireland at the moment because of the different because of all of the changes that Ireland as you know um, a small country has seen over the last 50 years or so and I suppose that is kind of it um, in terms of the presentation for this evening and um, so I am going to just stop sharing here um, I think I've done that have I? and ask if there are any, Yuri, is there time-wise, how are we doing? Um, and questions, as I see somebody has a question, but I just want to make sure that it's, you know, not a deep personal question that needs to be asked. Um, sure. And, uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Sharon. Um, muchas gracias, Sharon, por la presentación y también muchas gracias a todas las personas presentes. Eh, ahora vamos a ir a la parte más íntima donde empezaremos a hablar, a discutir e eh, informarnos un poco más. Las personas podrán contar, con alguna, contar algunas de sus experiencias y realizar preguntas por lo que la grabación será cortada en este momento. Thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, it was...